So we continue with the Megillah. What page? 1256. Nope, 1254. Okay. So the last thing we got to was Mordechai. Uh, mm-hmm. Mordechai uh, in Per Gimel, Pesachov. The last thing we had said was Mordechai informed Esther to inform Achashverosh that there was a plot to kill him, which she does. Uh, and uh, they hang these two guys, and it's written down in the Chronicles. Now, the next section is Achashverosh promotes Haman. And um, in Pesach Bays, four lines to the bottom, he promotes Haman above everybody else. And then, and now there's some that say it's because Haman gave the advice to execute Vashti, and that helped him end up with Esther, who he's absolutely infatuated with, so he rewards Haman. Because originally, in the first parak, he's called Memuchan, and the Gemara says Memuchan is actually Haman. So Achashverosh rewards Haman now, and he promotes it. But we said yesterday that that the uh, uh, there's the concept that Akadosh Baruch Hu brings the cure, Akadosh Baruch Hu brings the cure before he brings the disease. So Haman's the disease, but the cure is already in place. So then the Torah said, the, the Begillah says like this, All the servants of the king bow to Haman. That's what the king commanded uh, 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 regarding him. Mordechai would not bow. And there are different opinions. Why? One opinion is because Haman had some sort of idol on his chest. Mordechai refused to bow down to it. And so, Vayomer Avde Amelech Asher Bishar Amelech, top of page 1255. Why are you uh, violating the king's order? Vayihika Amram Elav Yom Yom. They said it every day. Veloshama Aleim. They wouldn't, uh, he didn't obey, they wouldn't listen, he wouldn't bow. Vayagidu Lahaman Liros Hayamdu Divrei Mordechai. They told Haman to come to the sea. If what Mordechai's policy is going to endure, ki higid la ma'asher hu yehudi. Tell Haman that he's a Jew. Now look what Haman does. What's his reaction? One Jew isn't bowing down to him. Vayar Haman ki Mordechai korea mishtach ha'velo. Vayim alay Haman chevaz. Haman gets angry because there's one Mordechai. Everybody is on the street is bowing to Haman as he walks past. And Haman's got an insatiable ego. One lousy Jew isn't bowing down to him. <laughs> And Haman can't take it. So what is his, what's his reaction? Haman says, It's beneath his dignity to go and punish Mordechai alone. He decides to destroy destroy all the Jews. All Jews have to go now. All Jews have to destroy them all. So obviously, you know, it's, if it, it would be comparable to having, imagine the President of the United States is talking to a whole group of people, and there's one heckler. And one guy starts yelling insults as the President. For the President to turn his attention to one guy who's a heckler, it's, such, it's so beneath this dignity. You know, but what are you, what are you paying attention to one shlamazel standing there over there? And you're, and you're, it's so beneath, Haman feels it's beneath my dignity to take it up with Mordechai alone. And therefore, since anyway he's an Amalekite who's got it in for the Jews, Haman decides the best thing over here is going to be to go and wipe out all the Jews. He's got the excuse he's been looking for to destroy the Jews. This isn't good. Maybe we can make this table wider. This day, in a minute, if we're going to sit this way, it should be a double table so then everybody could everybody could see. It's a, it's a, or I could see everybody that way. Next time we'll have to fix it up. So it's always when we had it stru- the room structured like this, there's always a double table here. So that it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more what he could conducive. In any event, so Haman decides to go and destroy the Jews. He makes a guy has a conversation with Achashverosh. He offers to pay him money for it. Achashverosh says, "Keep the money." And the Medrash says, based on that, we see Achashverosh has hated the Jews more than Haman did. That's what the Medrash says. Achashverosh is more than happy to have some have somebody go after the Jews. Mordechai finds out what's happened. The Gemara says he found out through Ruach Hakodesh. He knows there's a decree. And then Mordechai gets Esther involved. And this is where we skip to Mordechai finds out. And Mordechai, he has a very interesting conversation with Esther. And I want you to turn to page 1256, because this is very fascinating. Mordechai realizes now, and we're now talking in the 12th year, by the way. 
That means Esther has been the queen for five years at this point. She was the, became the queen in the seventh year of Ahasuerus' reign. Vashti was killed in the third year. She's killed in the seventh. She became the queen in the seventh year. And we are now in the twelfth year. So it's nine years after the banquet. Now, if someone would ask you, think about nine years. Think about where you were nine years ago. Nine years is a long time. What year are we in? Two, two, 20, where are we? We're 22, 13, 2013. Okay? Now, somebody would say to you, what ticked, why is there a decree against the Jewish people to be annihilated on the, on the 13th day of Adar, 11 months down the line? That's where Haman's lot came out. He drew lots, and it came out on the 13th day of Adar, which is 11 months later. And there's a decree that the Jews have to be annihilated. And letters go out to all the nations, sharpen your swords and get ready. There's going to be a military operation on the 13th of Ador. And the Jews understand, according to some, it said openly it's going to be Jew killing day. Others understood that it just says a military operation. Well, if there's a military operation, that's never good for the Jews. And the Jews understand they're in trouble. And Mordechai knows it's a decree against the Jews. Now, the... Uh, uh, um, Mordechai understands, if that's the case, why now he understands why Esther is the queen, number one. And number two, if somebody would ask you, why is there a decree against the Jews? What caused the decree? What would you say? If you were there, what would you say? Obviously, it just told us. That what? Mordechai provoked Haman. Right? Mordechai provoked Haman. That's what caused the decree. Says the Gemar, that's not why there was a decree against the Jewish people. Mordechai was actually right not to bow down to Haman. You know what caused the decree? Nine years earlier, the Jews went to, went to, a, went to a, 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 a banquet that they shouldn't have attended. When Achashosh made that gross banquet, they attended. Can you imagine? Who could possibly make the connection that something that happened nine years ago, that's why we were being punished today? Who could make that? How do you know that? What, what gave you the idea? Nine years along, a lot of things have happened since then. The answer is, Ruach HaKodesh could tell you that. And Mordechai says, that's why there's a decree. And that's what the Gemara says, that's why there is a decree. Because of something happened nine years earlier. That means the way God works is that like human beings, you know, there's usually immediate pay and pay back. You know, it doesn't take that long. Kodesh Baruch has a long memory. And let's see if you're going to do tshuva and nothing. Now we're going to have to wake you up. So there's a decree of annihilation against the entire Jewish people. And listen to this conversation. Mordechai says to Esther, he says, all right, pick it up on page 1256, where um, Mordechai says to Esther, um, uh, yeah, yeah, pick it up, and I'm just looking for the right, the puzzle. yeah, um, pay puzzle ches. Mordechai sends a message to Esther, it's uh, seven lines on the top. He mentions Vespas Shegen Kasav Hados Ashernitan Bishushan. He mentions the copy of the letter La Shmidam to destroy the Jews. Nasan Lo, he gives Hasach, who's the go between, Laharos as Esther to show Esther, Ula Hagidla, and to let her know. Now pay attention carefully. Ulitzavos Alea Lavoel Amelech Lishan and Lolavakesh Bafan of Alama. He is sending a message to Esther. He wants her to go to the king, and she's going to have to beg for the people. Now, there's a, there's a, 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 a law in the land. Achashverosh has a law. <coughs> Anybody who comes to the king, including her, without being summoned in advance, automatically forfeits their life. The guards have a shoot-to-kill the guards have a shoot-to-kill order. It's like the Secret Service men of the United States. Right? You have the President of the United States. You can imagine the President of the United States is, is waving to the crowd, and some guy starts running towards the President. What do they do? First thing is shoot him. Yeah. Right? They shoot to kill. Achashverosh, who is a king, and I know that kings are generally vulnerable, he has a, he's got guards. Anybody who enters the royal palace area without being summoned, automatically kill them. No questions asked. Shoot to kill. So Mordechai says to Esther, you're going to have to go beg the king. Meaning, you're going to have to go in without being called. Listen to what Esther says back to Mordechai. Pasuk Yud Aleph. Pasuk Yud Aleph, 11. She says to message back to Mordechai, your plan doesn't make sense. Kol amelech, all the servants of the king, that means the royal officials, the amedinos amelech, and the nations, everybody in the country knows, yodim, 
Asher kol ish ve ish asher yavo el melech any man or woman who goes to the king, el chotzer apdimis to the inner courtyard, asher lo yikare who is not invited, achas dasol lahamis. There's one policy: you get killed. Levad me asher yoshi lo melech asher vi dasol vchay unless the king starts out the royal scepter. Vani lo ni crazy lovo el melech zeshloshim yom. I haven't been invited into for thirty days. What's Esther saying to Mordechai? She's saying this is foolhardy. You're right, we got to do something about the decree. But listen, first of all, I don't have a chance. If I go in un un uninvited, there's no chance I'm going to survive it. I was not called in. Before he even has a chance to stretch out the royal scepter, they're going to kill me, number one. Number two, he hasn't called me in for 30 days. He's, he's bound to call me in. Yeah, they, 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 it wasn't that he called her in to discuss philosophy either. He's about, he's about to call me in one of these days. So why not just, just be a little patient and I'll be there. And number three, you got 11 months. You got 11 months. What's the rush? Well, let's work out something logical. We'll work out a plan and something will happen. Why do we have to do this right now where you're jeopardizing our chances? If I'm the only chance, so let's use me as the chance properly. You understand her argument? The brilliant argument. Very logical. So what does Mordechai say? Vayigidu Mordechai Zivrasa to report to Mordechai. Look at his response. Vayomer Mordechai Lashi Velester. Al Tadami Benaf Shech Leimali Beis Amir Mikal Yud. Don't think you're going to hide in the palace. Pasuk Yudalit. This is the key to the whole thing. Ki Macharech Tacharichi Kais Azos. If you're silent at this moment, Revach Vat Sola Yamod Layudim Imakom Acher. There will be a uh, what's it called? The salvation for the Jews will happen some other way. You and your father's household are going to go lost. Who knows if this isn't the reason you became the queen to do this right now? What's Mordechai saying? I want to tell you. I want to tell you something. The 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 most the best speech I ever the most uh, uh, what do you call it uh, a moving speech I ever heard in my life it was right here in the yeshiva. It was my I think my first or second year teaching here. So we're going back about thirty years, a little bit more. Somebody donated to the yeshiva, I think at the time it was a quarter of a million dollars, a certain family. We'll call them the Goldberg family. It wasn't, that wasn't their name, we'll call them the Goldberg. They donated about a quarter million of dollars to the yeshiva for this, for this room over here. Before this was called the Laufer Auditorium, it was called something else. Mm -hmm. And they had donated the money, about a quarter of a million dollars. There was an assembly in the base medrash, and there's going to be a presentation to this family. Uh, this is unbelievable. So in the old base medrash, not the new base medrash. There's, a, there's a, the assembly in the base medrash. And um, Rav Schiller Sr. got up to speak. And uh, the entire family is there. The base benches is packed. There are probably 250 people, 300 people in the base bench packed. I was sitting all the way on the back left desk, farthest one towards the back. And I was sitting there like this, and Rav Schiller gets up to speak. And I was sitting like this. I had my head in my hands because I felt, you know, here's a man who's given up basically... Uh, you know, he does everything for the yeshiva. He has to try to get money for the yeshiva. And he's a, it's not an easy thing at all. It's a, it's a hard thing. And here's this family, and they gave money, and now he's going to get up and slobber all over them. And I just felt bad for him. And, I felt, and I'm felt i just sitting there like, well, let's get this over with. So if Schiller gets up there, you know, what could you give somebody who's just giving you $250,000 at the time? So he gets up there, and he says, we'd like to thank the Goldberg family, and we'd like to present you, it was right around Purim time, he says, in the Goldberg family, we'd like to pre pre present you with a brand new Megillah's Esther. And what does it say in the Megillah? It says in the Megillah that Mordechai told Esther that she's going to be the salvation for the Jewish people. Now, I remember I was sitting like this, and as he started saying it, I did like this, because I was thinking to myself, I don't believe he's going to do this. I can't believe he's going to do this. He says, and Mordechai says to Esther, Esther, we need you to go into the king. And how does he try to convince her? He says to her, we need you to go to the king. And if you don't do it, you're going to go lost. But somebody else is going to do it. We'll have our salvation. And I, by this point, I was, he's actually doing this. right? He goes, and to the Goldberg family, we'd like to say, Thank you for having the wisdom of grabbing the opportunity to help the yeshiva. If it wouldn't have been you, it would have been somebody else. But you were the one. I'm telling you, I wanted to get on the table and cheer. He didn't, he didn't slobber. He maintained full dignity. And most of all, he spoke the truth. Now, I don't know if we ever got another donation from them. You know, you know that's something else. But it, it was, it was, I, was, I was ready to get on that table. I wanted to jump on the table. 
right? It was unbelievable. So Mordechai says, that says, listen, we need to go in there. And if it's not you, it'll be somebody else. Okay, but well, why is Mordechai doing this? It's not logical. Why would he want to do that? And she's right. Everything about it is right, is logical. Why does Mordechai say? The answer is that Mordechai doesn't want the Jews have to know things don't work in the world based on logic. That's our problem. We're always looking at natural cause and effect. You got to know there's a rebona shalom in the world. And the only way this is going to work is if you defy the natural order and you dafka go in right now. Logically, you're right. But I don't want it to work logically. That's not what Hashem wants. You were put in this position to go in now and show everybody that even against logic, that it's going to work even without logic. That's what Mordechai wants for Esther. Okay. So what does Esther do? She tells people, everybody, okay, fast for three days. And by the way, gentlemen, tomorrow's fast, one of the biggest misconceptions in Judaism is that Tainus Esther is not because the Jews fasted for three days. Because this fast took place Pesach time. The reason we fast tomorrow is because it's the 13th of Adar. And on the 13th of Adar, the Jewish people went to war with their enemies. And the halacha says when the Jewish people would go to war, they fasted. And therefore, it is very likely that when they went to war on the 13th, they were also fasting. Tomorrow's fast, which is called Tainus Esther, is commemorating the fast during the battle, not the fast of Esther before she goes into the, queen, into the king. So Esther is going to go now into the king, and she's going to petition Ahasuerus on behalf of the Jewish people. She's obviously going in willingly at this point, which is why she becomes prohibited to her husband Mordechai. Now, pick it up on Pesach. Vahi bayom ha-shlishi, so on the third day, Vatilbash Esther Malchus, she puts on royal garments. Vatamod Bachatzer Besa Melech Apnimi, she goes and stands in the inner courtyard. Nochach Besa Melech. Vah Melech Yoshev Al Kise Malchuso Bevesa Malchus Nochach Besa Bais. Achashverosh was sitting facing the entrance. And the Mephorshim say he didn't usually sit that way. So as Esther comes walking in, he just happened to be, it's another coincidence, he happened to be looking in that direction. Had he been sitting that way, she would have never made it in. The guards would have killed her. And Achashverosh happened to be sitting this way, and therefore he immediately saw her and said she could come in. He stretched out the royal scepter. But look what happens. Vayihi kirosa meleches Esther amalka omedes bechotzer. When he sees her standing there, nosachin be'enav. She found favor in his eyes. Vayoshet amelcha Esther esharvita zova shur biyodo. He stretches out the scepter, Vatikrav Esther, Vatika Brosha Sharvi. Now, put yourself in Ahasuerus' position. Esther What do you want? What's your request? I'll give you up to half the royal kingdom. And the Gemara says, he was saying, I'll give you half the kingdom, but not the base of Igdash. He's got this, he's got such a bee in his bonnet about the base of Igdash, he doesn't even know she's Jewish. I can have anything you want, lady, but not the base of Migdash. Who's talking about a base of Migdash over here? Okay, but put yourself in Ahasuerus' position. Esther comes walking in. As soon as Ahasuerus sees her, oh, she's cute. And you think of it, she just risked her life. She just risked her life. I know she risked her life. She knows she risked her life. And she knows that I know that she knows that she risked her life. And I know that she knows that I know that she knows that she risked her life. <laughs> So Ahasuerus understands this is going to be a biggie. Because if she's coming to me right now, she's risked her life to come in here, then obviously there's a biggie. Right? So put yourself down. Put, that's his mindset. So he says, what do you want? Vatomer Esther al says to the king, yeah, what would you like? Yimal ha-melech tov, if it pleases you, king. Yeah. Yeah, what's it going to be? I want you and Haman to come to a banquet. Ooh. That one sentence changes his entire view of Haman. Because he now realizes this Haman, who he's just so enamored with that he promotes to make the big royal official, his wife just risked her life for Haman. Right? Hey, let's have a banquet. Just me, you, and Haman. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Right? I'm just thrilled about that. Tell Haman, quick, quickly get Haman. So Achashverosh and Haman join Esther for a banquet. Now, there are three people at the banquet. Only one of them is enjoying himself. 
Ahasuerus is not happy because he doesn't know what the heck is going on. Esther's not happy because there's a decree to kill her people. And Haman is sitting there, hey, can I have some more of those roast potatoes? These are really good. Right? And he doesn't chop. He doesn't chop. The medrash, the medrash, he's like a pig going to the slaughter. There's a pig that's being fattened. And the pig is just eating like a pig. But say, hey, hey, this is great. He doesn't realize that he's being fattened up in order to be taken to the slaughter. So again, Ahasuerus says to Esther, what do you want? At the banquet. And look at the bottom line. Last word. Im. No, so let's see. Amelech. Now, look how she does this. I am so impressed. If I found favor in the eyes of the king, yeah, the email Amelech Tov, and if it pleases the king, Lasse says, She Lasse, Lasse's Bakashasi, and she drains it out. If I find favor, and if I, yeah, 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 come on, get to the point, lady. Yavo Amelech Vehaman El Amishta Sheresa Umochar Sagra. I want you and Haman to come to the banquet tomorrow. Mm hmm. Oh, she risked her life. She risked her life to invite him to another banquet, huh? To make a banquet to invite him to a banquet. But she's really got it in her. She's really, she's really, something's going on with her and Haman. He's convinced something's going on in Haman. Haman goes home, and he goes home from the banquet happy, and he tells everybody, and Haman is wealthy, by the way. Haman is the wealthiest, the, the Gemara says that there was the wealthiest Jew in history was Korach, and the wealthiest non-Jew in history was Haman. What's the common denominator between them? Fascinating common denominator. Look at Haman's wording. Haman says, in Pesach Yud Gimel, he tells his family, hey, I've invited, no one else was invited, and only I was invited, and, blah, 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 blah. and then in Pesach Yud Gimel, he says, v'chol none of this is, none of this means anything to me. B'chol none of it's worth anything to me, as long as I see there's no good Mordechai. So they say to him, hey, you know what, we got an idea. Why don't you be the gallows and go ask the king, the king will hang him. And obviously, you're the favored son over here. He'll do whatever you want. So Haman builds a gallows. Now, what's the common name between Haman and Korach? They're both wealthy, rich. They're both prominent. Haman's the vice president of the world. Right? Haman's the vice president of the world. Korach is a levy who carries the Aaron Kodesh. And neither of them was satisfied with what he had. They both wanted more, and that was their downfall. Haman says... None of it's worth anything to me. That's a person you don't understand. Haman, what you got. You can't be satisfied with what you got. Ezehu Asher has some apicalka. A wealthy man is one who's happy with his lot. If it doesn't matter how much money you got, if there's something more that you want, then you're not wealthy. Then you're poor. You're lacking. And it's that lack which brings Haman down. Pazag Vav. Perig Vav. Balayla who Oh, by the way, there's one other point I wanted to mention over here. When, when, when Mordechai says, go back to the Apostle Yudalad, a fascinating idea here. In Apostle Yudalad, back on 1256. When Mordechai says to Esther, if you look at the terminology, Ki im If you are silent at this point, then you and your family, you and your father's family will go lost. Who's her father that he's referring to? Her, she's got an ancestor. This ancestor is King Saul, Shoal Amelech. She's a descendant of Shoal. What did Shoal do wrong that he lost the, the royalty? He didn't kill Amalek. He didn't wipe them out. And that's why Haman is called Haman Ha'agagi, because the king of Amalek at the time of Shoal was King Agag, who Shoal did not kill. He left him alive, and that night he impregnated one of the maidservants, and that continued the Amalek -like, Amalekite line. Esther comes along and has an opportunity to be a tikkun for Shaul. She's a tikkun. She could rectify Shaul's misdeed. And the rectification is going to be the, the downfall of Haman. Mordechai is saying to Esther, you and your father's house will go lost. The father she's referring to is specifically Shaul. That you're the last chance to rectify Shaul's misdeed. If you don't do this, you and him are both going to go lost. Number one. Number two, there's a line beginning with Rachel. And the Gemara says that Rachel had an incredible ability of silence. She didn't speak. She kept a secret. When was it she kept the secret? Yes. With her sister. She gave her sister the codes and didn't tell anybody about it. She let Leah go in and marry Yaakov and she was discreet and she managed to not tell anybody. As a result, she ends up with, the Gemara says, she is rewarded with a descendant called Shaul. The king Shaul comes from Shevet Binyamin. What is the connection between Shoal and, and, and Rachel? The connection is that Shoal also was discreet. When Shoal went looking, the Nach says he went, his father lost some donkeys, 
And Shoal went, Shoal went to go find these donkeys. He ended up by Shmuel Hanovi, the prophet Shmuel. And the prophet Shmuel said to him, he had to travel for three days. He said, forget about the donkeys. I got different news for you. I'm anointing you king of Israel, which is pretty significant. And so he anoints him as king. And then the Nach says he came home and his uncle saw him. He said, anything, what's new? You know, anything happened on the way? Ah, he starts talking, he says, and then he says, he didn't say a word about becoming the king. Now, you know, they think that would probably be pretty prominent news. You know, we, you know oh, by the way, I got a seat in business and I'm king. You know, you, you, would, you, would, you would tell somebody about what happened on your trip when you become king. It's a good thing. And he's got that trait of silence. Where does he get it from? He gets it from his ancestress, Rachel. And then he's got a descendant named Esther. And what does Esther do? Mordechai says, don't tell him you're Jewish. Where does she get that ability from? He gets that ability from her ancestor, Shoal, who got it from his ancestors, Rachel. What's Mordechai saying to Esther over here? saying, if you're silent now, gentlemen, I pointed this out several times. What is the Mida of Avram Avinu? What is Avram Avinu? Chesed. Okay. Now look, take a look at the life of Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu abandons his elderly father. He throws his nephew out of the house. He gets involved in a world war. He throws one son out of the house. He throws Ishmael out of the house. He takes a knife to himself and his entire household in an act of self-mutilation called bris milah. And then he takes a knife to the neck of his second son. There's no one in the Torah that we find involved. He's involved in a world war. There's no one in the Torah who are involved with knives as much as Avram Avino. And he's the Ish Chesed. What's Yitzhak Svida? Vura, Din, strict, strict justice, the strict high school principal. What do we find by Yitzchak? His name means laughter. He entertains his wife. He tolerates the wayward son. He walks away from a confrontation, even though he was completely right with the Philistim. And his mita is Din. What's Yaakov's mita? MS, truth. He deceives his brother, deceives his father, deceives his brother, deceives love. And everywhere, touch him where he will, there's a deception. What's the common denominator? Each one of them, their meat is exactly the opposite of their behavior. That means the test of whether or not you control the meat or the meat controls you is if you could do the opposite. You could be a Baal Chesed, but if you're a Baal Chesed, somebody's leg is gangrene and you got to cut off their leg and you say, I can't do it. So you're not a Baal Chesed, you're just a softy. If a guy comes to you on the street and says, I need, hey brother, can you spare a buck? And he's got a rusty needle sticking out of his arm and you can't say no, you're not a generous person. You're not a, you're not a kind person. You're just a softy, you can't say no. How do you know that you could, if you're din, but you could tolerate the wayward son or you could give in even though you're right, that means you're in control of the trait. The trait doesn't control you. And the same thing when it comes to Emmas. You're a man of truth. And what do you do when your wife says to you, how do you like my new sweater? And it looks to you like something that the Salvation Army couldn't get rid of. Right? What do you guys say? Ooh, ooh. Right? You say to your wife, gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Oh, gorgeous. That's truth. To be able to go to the opposite extreme, that's truth. Otherwise, you're not a man of truth. You just can't, you know, you're just, you just say, you're just blunt. You're not a man of truth. That's the difference. Mordechai is saying, and you find this by the trade all the way through the Torah. It's a fascinating thing. Who's the most humble man in history? And he has to take over leadership of the entire people. Mm-hmm. You find you find this you find this all through all through the Nach. Mordechai is saying to Esther, "I told you not to speak. I told you not to speak, and you didn't speak. You managed to keep the secret. Now is the time to talk. Now you're going to have to talk. And if you're silent right now, im hacharish tacharishi." That just shows retroactively that what you've accomplished until now wasn't you. It's just you happen to have a trait that you inherited from your, from your ancestors. And you can't control it. You're always quiet because that's your nature. And the truth, the, the, the real indication is, yes, by nature you're a, you're a silent person. Now you have to talk. Now let's see you talk. Now let's see you do it. That's the test of whether or not you control the trait or the trait controls you. So in Pazuk Vav, Achashrosh can't sleep. Balayla hu nada melech. Pause the Page 1257. Ahasuerus can't sleep. There's a measure that says he had a dream. He saw Haman standing over him with a sword ready to kill him. That's a bad dream. 
Vayomer lohavi sefer zichronos divrei yamim v'yu nikroin lefnei amalech. He says, bring the chronicles. Why? Achashverosh is thinking to himself, look, Esther was just at one banquet with Haman. She's inviting Haman to another banquet. There must be some hanky-panky, something going on between them. Now, if there's something going on between them, three's a crowd, there's probably a plot to kill me. I've been a good benevolent king. Why hasn't anybody stepped in and let me know there's a plot? He figures there's only one. He's a real lamdan. With the thumb. He says, there's got to be one reason. Probably somebody once saved my life and didn't get rewarded. And everybody realizes, what should I get involved in? Let him kill the king. What, I got to get involved? A curse on both their houses. I, I should get involved in high, in, in high government intrigue. There's nothing in it for me anyway. Bring me the Chronicles. Let's see. Let me see. And sure enough, they read the Chronicles, and it turns out that Mordechai had once saved the king's life. That was when he reported to Esther. Esther said it in the name of Mordechai. In Posa Gimel, Vayomer HaMelech, Ma Nasa Yekaru Gdulu LeMordechazeh. And how was Mordechai rewarded? Vayomru, Nari HaMelech Mishorsev, Lo Nasa Yimodavar. Nothing was rewarded. He wasn't rewarded. I heard he goes, Ah, aha, uh-huh. okay. And look at the next pasuk. Vayomer Amelech mi bechatzer. Who's in the courtyard? The Haman balachatzer beis Amelech achitzon lelomer lamelech litlos es Mordechai leisha shir hechilo. Haman had just arrived. Haman had just arrived to come to Achashverosh. So he wants Mordechai to be hung. And Achashverosh says, "Who's out there? Who's in the courtyard?" Now pay attention carefully. You'll notice the order. This bothered me. Look at the order over here. Achashverosh first says, who's in the courtyard? And only then the Megillah reports, and Haman had arrived in the courtyard. I mean, it should have sounded the other way. It should have said, Haman just arrived. Hey, hey, who's out there, right? So, and look what they, well, look what they answer him. Is Haman in the courtyard? Let him come in. By the way, I don't think Achashverosh said, Vayomer HaMelech Yavo. I think Akash says, Vayomer HaMelech, Yavo. Right. I think it was more like, let him come in. <laughs> bring him, bring him. <laughs> bring him to me. Why? Look at the order here. Akash says, who's in the courtyard? When did he say this? Right after finding out that Mordechai wasn't rewarded. What was he really asking? He wasn't saying, who's in the courtyard physically? Because Haman hadn't gotten there yet. He was saying, Who's in charge of the royal courtyard that should have made sure that Mordechai was rewarded? And coincidentally, who had just arrived? Haman had just arrived. So the, 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 the attendants, thinking that Achashverosh meant, who's out there? So they just said, well, it's Haman. And he wasn't the guy in charge of the royal courtyard. But that's not what Achashverosh heard. All Achashverosh heard was, who's in charge of the royal courtyard? They said, well, it's Haman. He said, uh-huh. Oh, the guy who saved my life, Haman, who's in charge, did not reward him. <laughs> Yavo. All right, let him come in, right? Because now we're going to get this all straightened up. So he comes in and Haman comes in. Yeah, we're going to ask him. Uh, did Achashverosh know Mordechai was Jewish when he saved his life? Yes. Achashverosh knew Mordechai is Jewish. All along he knows he's Jewish. So uh, 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 Achashverosh then says to Haman, what should I do? What should I do with a guy that I want to reward handsomely? So Haman says, well, who could the king possibly be? Who could the king possibly want to reward as much as me? Now, if you pay attention, if you take a look in Pesach Zion. Vayomer Haman el HaMelech. Ish asher HaMelech chafetz bikro. A man who the king wants to honor. Yaviu levush malchus asher lova ba amelch. Now Achashverosh knows Haman, and he knows that Haman thinks he's talking about Achashverosh. Says, "Who should? How should I reward a man that I really want to reward?" So Achashverosh, Haman immediately gets you know his eyes light up. He says, "Oh, I see it. I see it now. Bring the royal garments." Achashverosh looking at him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he understands the Haman. Oh, <laughs> royal garments. Yeah, right. And the royal horse. Oh, the royal horse too, huh? Mm-hmm. I know exactly what this guy wants. And a royal crown for his head. And the Medrash says, when he mentioned the crown, 
Ahasuerus gave him such a dirty look that he drops it in the next, at the end of it. He drops the crown business. So he says, give it to somebody from the high officials and put the guy on a horse and let him go out and announce, Four lines from the bottom. Vayomer HaMelech LaHaman, Maher, quickly, Kaches HaLavush VeZasus, Kasher Dibarta, take every, the horse and the garments, Vaseichen LaMordechai HaYehudi HaYoshev V'Shar HaMelech, do it for Mordechai the Jew sitting in the royal court. So the Gabor says, he said, do it to Mordechai. And Haman said, well, there are a lot of Mordechais. He says, the Jew. There's a lot of Jews named Mordechai. Because the last thing he wants is to do this to Mordechai, his arch enemy. Hayoshe Bashar Amalek. There's only one Jew named Mordechai sitting in the royal, in the royal gate. Do it to him. Al tapel dover me kosher. Don't leave out any details. Haman understands he's an interim death. When the king does it, he understands an interim death. So Haman takes it and he gives Mordechai a ride. And the Gemara Megillah says that, you know, there's a famous story that, that Haman comes home uh, of, uh, in Pesach Yud Beis, 1258. Vayoshev Mordechai, he gives him this ride and he announces, makes this royal announcement. And you got to put it in presence. You know, you got crowds and mobs of people out there. Mordechai's up on a horse. Haman's leading him. Whoa, people are out there. And Mordechai's dressed in royal garments and Haman's leaving him around like a neb. <laughs> and it says that it says that, that Mordechai's daughter was up on the roof and she had the chamber pot full of full of excrement Haman. and uh, Haman's daughter and she had that chamber pot and as they came driving past she figured the guy in front is Mordechai the guy leading the horses must be my father I'm sitting on horses my father and she dumped the chamber pot bullseye one of the miracles of the Megillah that a woman <laughs> had such good aim bullseye on the guy in front and Haman looks up and she sees it so she jumped off the roof and committed suicide yeah. so Haman comes home Vayoshev, Vayoshev Mordechai, Sharmel, Mordechai goes right back to where he was he comes home in a state of mourning and with his head, head hung low. And he tells his wife what happened. And then in Pasuk Yudalid, seven lines from the top. They're in the middle of talking to him. And they urge, they hurry Haman up to the second banquet. Party time! And the Gemara says he didn't even have time to wash himself off. Uh, yeah, that's a bad way to go to a party with the king. So, he comes to this party, and there are two questions here. The first question is they're at the second banquet. And at the second banquet, Esther says to him, Ahasuerus says, all right, who is it? Who is it? And Esther says, what do you, he says, what do you want? And Esther says, We've, there's a decree to wipe out myself and my entire people. Now, who is it? She says, it's Haman. The Medrash says she started pointing at Ahasuerus. And the Malach moved her finger. Wouldn't be, very, wouldn't be very good, because she's a woman of truth. Well, who is it that hates the Jews so much who wants to kill them? Well, it's you! <laughs> and the Malach, the Malach comes and he moves her, face, moves her hand. So, there are two things here, two questions. Question number one is, why did she wait to the second banquet? Why did Esther wait to the second banquet? Why didn't she do that? If she has already got a name at the banquet, why didn't she wait to the first banquet? To build up his curiosity. Build up his curiosity is one answer. Make him more angry at Haman. Make him more angry. That's what, that's what uh, get, let's get him good and angry. The Medrash says, that the, the before she explained, Esther is also looking for a sign. The Gemara says, why did Esther invite Haman to a banquet at all? The Gemara gives about 10 reasons. There are 10 Amorim give reasons. <laughs> She wanted Ahasuerus to suspect a, a plot between them and he killed both of them. And in the old days when you killed a minister, she didn't mind dying, but if you killed the minister, his decree is automatically annulled. Uh, she wanted to keep him close just in case she gets an idea. Uh, she didn't want the Jews to be too confident, so she felt that the Jews would say, well, it's one of, you know, we got a Jew in high, high government, you know. She wanted the Jews to be nervous that maybe she's in cahoots with Hamans that they would daven and do tshuva and not rely on her. The Gemara brings 10 reasons that she had in mind. And one of the Amorites saw Elia and Ovi. And he said, which one of these reasons was it? And he said, all 10 of them. That means, to give you an idea of what Esther was, you got 10 Amorites in the Gemara offering what she was thinking. And the Gemara is telling you she was thinking what all 10 Amorites said. That's just to give you an idea of, of who Esther is. 
But the commentary explained that Esther wasn't sure. She wants to keep Haman near, just in case she gets an idea. She doesn't know what she's going to do yet. She doesn't know how this is going to work out. She just wants to keep it, you know, let's keep it on the burner. And then something happens. What happens? She sees a sign. Haman all along has been over here. What happened between the first banquet and the second banquet? There's been a switch. Mordechai goes up and Haman goes down. Between the two banquets is when he led Mordechai around on the horse. As soon as she sees Haman is going down, then she understands that is a sign, Mina Shemaim, that now is the time is ripe. Now the mazel is changing, and now is the time to take down Haman. And therefore, at the second banquet, she's willing to make the report to Achashverosh, and she's willing to say, it's Haman. The commentaries say that Achashverosh gets up. Now watch this. Um, Pasuk, uh, the Pasuk Zayit. Ve'hamelech kam b'chamaso b'mishte ayan yachadosh gets up in a wrath, in a rage. El gina sabitot. He goes out to the garden. Ve'haman amad levake shal nafsho me'esther amalka kira kichosay lovera me'esamelech. Haman goes out Achashverosh goes out to the garden to cool off. And Haman is begging for his life from Esther. And the matter of the Gemara says he went out to the garden and he saw there were angels out there dressed as lumberjacks chopping trees in the garden. He says, what are you doing? Why are you chopping trees? They said, Haman told us. So how does he hear that? He hears that as, oh, palace renovations. Right? He's planning on becoming, this is all simply ratifying what Achashverosh has been suspecting. Well, so that gets him even angrier. So he comes back in. What does he see? Haman is jumping on the couch where Esther is. She's lying there like Cleopatra and Haman's falling all over her. The Gemara says the angel kept pushing him on her. And Achashverosh, What? You want to conquer the queen with me in the house? The words came out of Achashverosh's mouth and Haman's face was covered. In the old days when the king was really enraged and people knew that the guy's going to die, they immediately put a cloth over his face. Because seeing his face only gets the king angrier. And they don't want an angry king. So it says, How does the article translate it? And, uh, uh, and they covered Haman's face. And now here comes one of the great fair weather fans in history. Is one of the fine, one of the best fair weather fans in history. Vayomer Carvona, Echad bin Asaris of Ifnei Hamelech. Hey, Gam Hinei Ha'Eitz Asher Osa Haman LeMordechai. There's the gallows that Haman made, Asher Diber Tov Alamelech, which which he made for Mordechai, who saved the king's life. Oh, he wants to hang the people who saved my life, huh? Omed Bevei Saman Gavah Chamishi Mama. So the commentary say, hey, how did Charvona know that, it, you know, I mean, you're sitting over here, and you're looking out there, hey, there's a 50 Yama gallows over there. How do you know it's 50 Yamas? How do you know it's 50 Yamas? Because right? he was in on the plot with Haman. He was, that's the only way you could possibly know. But you know too many details here. How do you know he was in on the plot? Yeah, but he knows, he sees which way the winds are blowing. Right? This is his last gas. He was with Haman all along. All of a sudden, Haman's in trouble. Hey, Kingy, there's the gallows that Haman said with Mordecai who spoke good for you. And the commentators say that Achashverosh even heard the word good for you the wrong way. It was good for you. Achashverosh said he meant the gallows are good for you. Achashverosh says, hang him. They hang Haman on the gallows. The the king's wrath subsided. The king's wrath over here refers to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. That the wrath that was still in place since the time of Shoal, that wrath subsided. There's one point here that people overlook. The Esther went through an intense test just now. Who's Esther? This sweet base Yaakov girl who bakes brownies and kugel. And she's, she's a, wearing a, you know, she's in this palace, but she's still the sweet base Yaakov, the kindest, sweetest girl you'd ever meet, the, that sort of thing. And there's a guy begging for his life. A guy begging for life, and he's crying. There's no question that he's crying, and he's begging for his life. You understand the test? And it's like, okay, we'll give him another chance. 
that's the test that Shaul failed. Esther has to pass one, that's the last test she has to fail, that she does not give in to Abba. She had, she had what's it called with the king? Pardoning, pardoning powers. And she doesn't pardon him. At that point, Esther is going through a very intense test. The end of the Megillah is that the Jewish people end up killing their enemies. And all of the, all the, what do you call the details of how they get out of the, out of the decree and so on and so forth. But again, I don't have time to go through it now. I do recommend that sometime before Purim, maybe before Purim, you should go through the Megillah to get, to see if you can get a read through the entire Megillah. So it's familiar with it, even during, while he reads it. And just remember that when he reads the Megillah, when he reads the Megillah, you have to hear every word. So you have a chumash in front of you when he reads the Megillah and you do not read along with him like Shabbos. Now, on Shabbos, something you read along with the Balkari. You do not read along with them. You have to hear every single word. And, uh, and uh, uh, if you didn't hear a word, so just read it in the Chumash in front of you. That, that, that works. All right.